This program is brought to you by the Kentucky Small Business Development Center in Louisville. We provide the professional expertise, tools, and resources to help you succeed. To connect with a business coach, call 502-625-0123 or email sbdcinfo at uky.edu. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Toolkit Tuesday. Uh, my name is Janet Flaw. I'm with the Kentucky Small Business Development Center in Louisville. I'm sitting in for Dave today. And uh, today uh, we have a return guest speaker coming with us. Um, we had him back in the fall and had a lot of valuable information for all our folks. And so we're going to welcome him back in just a second. Uh, I'll just let you know that we'll do a Q&A at the end of uh, the presentation. Uh, you can post any questions you might have in the Q&A. You'll find that at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, you might have to move your mouse or kind of touch your screen. We also have the chat open. Um, so if you like to share with us where you're uh, joining from today, we'd appreciate seeing that. Um, also, if you have any technical questions you, or technical issues, you can post that in the chat as well. So just to let you know that. And also at the end of the presentation, um, we'll have a short evaluation for you to fill out and share your thoughts about today. So look for that. So we're going to go ahead and move forward and welcome Rafael Collazo from the Grisanti Group. And we're going to talk about leasing today. So welcome, Rafael, welcome back. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Janet. It's always great to be back here to talk about the commercial leasing process, which again, like we said, we, we kind of touched on uh, earlier last year, or I guess later in the year last year. And so I'm excited to be back. So I'm going to step aside and let you get started. Okay. So what I'll go ahead and do, guys, is share my screen real quick, just so we can uh, let me know. Can you guys see this? You guys got, you guys see it? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. All right. So uh, for those of you guys who are tuning in for the first time, uh, we're just going to be discussing uh, the commercial leasing process. You know, this is something that when I first start uh, speaking with, in particular, those who are just starting a business, sometimes it can be a little bit of an opaque process and people are kind of confused about it. So hopefully through this presentation, you guys get a feel for what uh, what the process looks like and then any hurdles or anything that can come come across during the process, at least you're better equipped to be able to handle any of that. So uh I guess first to start out, I'll, I'll share a little bit about myself. So who am I? Uh, I'm actually a former engineer and software uh, implementation consultant. I studied engineering in college at Arizona State University, graduated in 2013, and then got into a, a software implementation consultant role where we implemented software systems for government agencies across the, the nation and abroad. I've had the privilege of working in D.C., Puerto Rico, and then ultimately in Louisville, Kentucky to help replace the financial software system for the city. Back in 2019, I transitioned away and became a full-time commercial real estate agent and been operating in that capacity for the last, you know, probably just about three years now, which is crazy to think. Uh, I'm also the author of a book called Before You Sign That Lease, The Small Business Owner's Guide to Leasing Commercial Space. Uh, it is a comprehensive guide for business owners that are interested in leasing commercial space and kind of details all the things you need to think about as you're going through the process. Uh, and I utilize a lot of the concepts and, and, and insights that I share in the book to be able to provide you within this presentation to give you a snapshot of what you can expect in that book. And I'm actually going to be releasing my latest book uh, before you buy that building, which is the Small Business Owner's Guide to Purchasing Commercial Property uh, in July. And that's going to be a similar process, but really focused on the acquisition of commercial property for your business use. So one thing I like to do with presentations is I like to get a feel for who's in the audience. Uh, it helps kind of help me provide or help me uh, provide color and context to the presentation. And I try to speak to uh, the audience. So if you guys don't mind sharing where you're currently located, if you're a startup, maybe share a little bit about your business and whether or not you experience years of experience, et cetera. I think that'd be helpful. So I'll just uh, give about 20 seconds or so for you guys to type away in the chat box. Group practice owner, Lexington. Awesome. Welcome. Barbara. Aaron. Uh, Camp Landing Entertainment District. Ashland, Kentucky. Awesome. Jones tuning in from Louisville. That's great. Oh, Necessary Comforts. Jones has a business called Necessary Comforts. That's great. 
Oh, nice. Uh, Bruce Wilson with ba Bessa Coffee in Barstown, Kentucky. That's great. Awesome. So we have a variety of different uses out there, which is really, really cool. Nice. We have a residential real estate agent who wants to venture into commercial. That's great. That's a good starting point to kind of get a feel for what's out there and the things you need to consider. All right. So, you know, thanks. Thanks first off for, for sharing that insight. Uh, I'll try to use that to be able to provide some context to what I'll be sharing for the rest of the presentation. So typically when I first start working with a commercial client, uh, you know, the first question I ask them is, do you actually need a space to begin with? Uh, this is obviously somewhat of a, of a, you know, a forward question, but in reality, a lot of times business owners don't necessarily need the space or maybe they can't commit to the space initially. And so uh, just to give you an understanding of what commercial leasing entails is that typically it's a long-term commitment, unlike you know, an apartment lease where you're typically signing on for 12 months. Sometimes you can even go month to month in apartments. Uh, commercial leases are typically a long-term commitment, a three to five year commitment. And again, depending on where you're at in the, in the, in the state, you, know, there, you may be finding situations where you can actually have a year lease or 24 month lease, but typically it's a three to five year commitment. So you, know, you really have to want to be in that location and want to operate your business out of that location for that, that time frame. Uh, most of the time. Along with that, having a uh, space increases your business's overhead. And as you're starting to get into the business, unless you absolutely need the space, limiting your overhead is a good opportunity for you to be able to utilize those resources and other capacities to help you build and grow your business. So, you know, really getting a feel for, you know, what value a space is going to provide you such that it's worth the additional overhead is really something to consider. Along with that, some business uses don't even need commercial space to begin with. If you're a catering business, sometimes all you need to do is just rent space in a commercial kitchen. You know, periodically, you can just rent it for a few hours on the weekend to do what you need to do as far as the gigs that you, you book are concerned. If you're a software developer, you can go in your home office. You can have, you know, go to a coffee shop. Uh, you can use a co utilize a co-working space on a month-to-month -month basis. And even if you're a traveling trainer, uh, you don't necessarily have to have you know, an actual physical space to have all your gym equipment and whatever else you can travel to your clients, go to their homes. Maybe you can get a, a gym membership and have your clients go to the gym and you can train them on site as well. So there's a variety of different business uses where a commercial space may not even be necessary. So that's always something to consider prior to actually moving forward with a commercial space. So once you have an idea or have time to think about what the implications of a commercial space are, Typically, like I said, I allow my clients to get some time to think about it and make sure that the decision of moving forward with leasing a commercial space is right for them. And so once they do decide that that actually is the right decision for them, then we start elaborating and, and, and explaining the different types of commercial leases out there. You know, and apartment leases are usually pretty cookie cutter. Uh, the responsibilities are, are pretty, pretty clearly spelled out for the landlord versus the tenant. But in commercial leases, there's a variety of different responsibilities depending on what lease type you sign. So what we're going to go ahead and do now is explain the different types of commercial leases out there so you understand what you're getting into. All right. So the first type of commercial lease is called a full service gross lease. Uh, this, these are most commonly found in office. And then sometimes, although rarely you see it in retail and industrial, and then sometimes in multifamily, you may see it as well. Uh, essentially, what this means is that you pay one flat base rent and it covers all operating expenses, including your water, electric, et cetera. Uh, you know, the owner is typically in these situations responsible for all operating expenses, including taxes, insurance, utilities, internet, uh, uh, sometimes you name it, they're responsible for it. And because of this, full service gross lease rates are typically higher than other types of lease rates because the, the owner is taking on the additional burden of, of, paying for all the operating expenses. So if you're comparing two leases and one's a full service gross lease and one's another type of lease, oftentimes you'll see the number being higher because of that fact. So again, full service gross leases are, are this type of lease. Number two is a modified gross lease. Now, modified gross leases are somewhat common in, in, in office, can be common in retail and industrial and multifamily. Uh, this is where the costs are shared by the owner and the lessee, the person who is actually leasing the space. Uh, responsibilities uh, for the, the lease uh, responsibilities are typically negotiated prior to leasing. You know, in a lot of cases, what you'll see is in modified gross leases is that the landlord will be responsible for paying the property taxes, insurance, 
and, you know, general maintenance, but then, you know, the, the tenant may be responsible for utilities, water usage, internet, et cetera. Um, you know, because the tenant bears some responsibility to the op for the operating expenses, the base rents for these leases are going to be typically lower than a full service gross lease. Um, so when you com you're comparing a modified gross lease to a full service gross lease, you'll oftentimes see that base rent be higher in a in a full service gross lease versus a modified gross lease because the tenant's going to have to pay for additional operating expenses. Now, percentage leases are not super common, at least in our market. There are there are more common across the country, and really they're primarily primarily focused on the retail sector. Essentially, what a percentage lease is is that the tenant pays a, a particular base rent plus a percentage of sales above a of a, a, a break point. And this break point is, is either a percentage uh, of, you know, above a certain amount that's specified clearly within the lease agreement or is calculated via this method that we're going to go through uh, in, in, in this slide. So just as an example, we're going to walk through a formula to be able to calculate percentage rent. And then I'll walk through the actual, you know, numbers of it. So you guys get a feel for what, what exactly this looks like. So a yearly rent for these types of percentage lease agreements include a base rent plus a percentage rent. The break point, as I mentioned, is the amount above which you start paying percentage rent. So that typically is calculated by taking the yearly base rent and dividing it by the percentage that you agree to. Therefore, the percentage rent is going to be gross sales minus your break point times your percentage rent. Or if that number is, some, is negative, then obviously you don't pay any percentage rent at all. So let's go through an example to make it a little bit easier to understand. So in order to define your break point, oftentimes in the lease agreement, you'll say if your percentage rent is 5%, you would take whatever your base, your, your base rent is over the course of a year, which would be $120,000 in this case. So you're saying what we're saying is that, you know, the base rent is $10,000 a month or $120,000 per year. You would divide that by 5%. And your break point as defined within your lease agreement would be $2.4 million. What this means is that for every dollar above 2.0 million that you make, you have to pay 5% of that set amount in additional rent or, or what's known as percentage rent. So your percentage rent obligation, let's say that you know you have a great year and you go gangbusters and you make $3 million that year. Well, in order to calculate your percentage rent ob obligation for the year, you would take your $3 million subtract it by 2.4 million, and then multiply that by 5%, which gives you $30,000 per year in it, or for that particular year, I should say, in percentage rent. And typically these percentage rent totals are, are, are collected either quarterly, biannually, or, or, or annually. All right, so land lease. Well, what a land lease is, you know, is, is, is essentially you're renting the land. And these, this is most common in mobile home parks, sometimes in retail as well, and then prime real estate, you know, across the country in, er in areas where, you know, you're located in a prime location. Sometimes the owners don't want to sell the property. They'll just prefer to lease the land. And then, you know, developers can come in and develop property on that land. Now, the, 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 in a situation where you're just renting land to store stuff on, this, this happens a lot with logistics companies. They'll rent parcels of land that are zone industrial, gravel them up, and then store trucks on them. You know, that's not really an issue. You're just going to rent the land for the period of time. And there's really nothing additional you have to factor into your analysis. Now, the problem is the problem comes in when you start building stuff on the land. And this happens a lot when you talk about land leases for retail. Uh, you know, you'll lease a land piece of land and then build a fast casual dining restaurant on them or, you know, a Walgreens or, or whatever other use on that site. Now, the problem with that is that these buildings become fixtures to the land once you construct uh, the, the property or the, the building on them, which means that at the end of the lease term, that building reverts back to the landlord and you have no claim to that building itself. And so that's why you see land leases in particular, if you're going to be developing on the property, that these land leases can be extremely long, you know, oftentimes over 50 years with and even sometimes over 100 years with options. So th those, those are somewhat common across the country. And you'll see them here periodically as well. I'm actually working on a land lease right now uh, for, for a car wash. So you know, they're going to have a really long lease in place, and they're going to develop a car wash on it. And you know, it's going to be 40 to 50 years of, of lease. 
Um, and then typically for land leases, they're going to have the lowest rents, base rents, I should say, uh, when compared to a similar caliber of property that has a full service gross lease, modified gross lease, or percentage lease. All right. So this is probably one of the more common types of leases out there, in particular, if you're in an office or a retail or industrial setting. Uh, these, are what, these are what's known as net leases. Uh, these are most common in retail, industrial, and then you'll sometimes see it in office in our market. You're, you're, it's more common to see full service gross lease and modified gross. But in other parts of the country, I've interviewed people in Houston and Dallas and New York, et cetera, you'll, you'll sometimes see it where they have net leases in place in those property types. But essentially what this means uh, as far as net leases are concerned is the tenant is responsible for paying some or all of the building related expenses. And there's three types of net leases. There's single net lease, double net lease, and triple net lease. And we're gonna go through each lease type so you have an understanding of what the obligations are for the tenants. All right, so a single net lease means that the tenant is responsible for paying a portion or all of the property taxes on the building, hence the single N in the, in the lease agreement. What this means is that all other operating expenses, including water, electric, and phone, are gonna be covered by the landlord. Um, and they're all, the landlord is also gonna be responsible for, oh, I'm sorry, no, the tenant is gonna be responsible for water, electric, and phone, along with the uh, pro rata portion of the property taxes for the building. And then the landlord's gonna be responsible for the building insurance and building maintenance. So that's single net lease. A double net lease means that the tenant is responsible for paying a portion or all of the property taxes and building insurance for the property. Along with that, they're going to be responsible for paying their own operating expenses, which typically includes water, electric, phone, internet, et cetera. And then the landlord is really just going to be responsible for maintaining the property in good working order, general maintenance on the property. And, and oftentimes it includes the interior of the, the space as well. Now, in a triple net lease, which is the most common, I would say, um, in retail and industrial properties, is that the tenant is responsible for paying their pro rata share of taxes, insurance, and general maintenance for their, the interior of their space. Now, what is pro rata? Pro rata means that you, it, it's the percentage that's allocated to your space. So if you're in a 10,000 square foot building and you occupy 5,000 square feet, that means you occupy half the square footage within the building. Therefore, you pay half the tax bill, half the insurance bill, half the maintenance bill, or, the, or you, you pay all your general maintenance for your, the interior of your, of your particular space. So that's what pro rata means. I should have clarified that at the beginning. And then along with that, you're going to be responsible for your general operating costs, which include you know, water, electric, phone, et cetera. In these situations, the landlord is typically responsible for covering the structure and the roof of the property. So if anything happens with the structure or if the roof is damaged and is, is, uh, is, is leaking water, they're typically going to handle that. Now, there are certain situations where you'll see an absolute net lease. That means that everything is on the tenant, including if, the, if there's a structural issue and then a roof issue, that can be on the tenant. And, and oftentimes in our market, it's not super common. You'll, you'll often see it in single tenant net lease properties. So those are the Walgreens. Those are sometimes the quick service restaurants. You know, the operators will lease the space and take full responsibility for the buildings and the, the landlords are essentially are completely hands off and the responsibility of maintaining that building, everything related to that building is on the tenant itself. So those are most, most common in those situations. All right. So one thing I like to run through with, with uh, potential uh, clients that I start working with is that a lot of times there's a disconnect as far as what your actual obligations are going to be for building related expenses. Oftentimes, uh, tenants will look at, at spaces and say, oh, this is $2,500 a month. So that's what I'm going to be paying each month in, in, in expenses pertaining to the building. But oftentimes, as you'll see, there's other factors involved when you, when you start factoring in all the expenses you need to pay for your building. And this is where net charges, which is you know the charges associated with net leases, or CAM charges or expenses, which are common area maintenance charges, which you'll often see in shopping centers. So it, it, it takes, you know, you have to take out the trash, you have to, you know, uh, pave, you know, the, the parking lot, you have to clean up trash just to maintain the, 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 
the, the, the shopping center in good working order. And a lot of times landlords will cover that all under common area maintenance. So shared common areas for all the other tenants, that's what's related to common area expenses. So these, these types of expenses are typically stated in a price per square foot, similar to what you would see in you know, marketing for you know, rents. Uh, you know, it may be $12 a square foot or $15 a square foot for the rent. And then the cam charges, the net charges are going to be, you know, $2 a square foot additional or $3 a square foot additional. They're all going to be uh, marketed as a price per square foot. So really, when you're doing these calculations for your business, you, your real cash outflow as it pertains to your building related expenses are going to be your base rent. So what, whatever the square foot advertised rate is for your your the base rent plus whatever the advertised square foot price is going to be for your net or cam charges times the total square foot of the property. So let's go through an example so you guys get a feel for what I'm talking about. All right, so let's say that you're looking for a retail space. You need 3,000 square foot of space to operate your you know restaurant out of. Uh, you find a great location in the shopping center and they're marketing the space at $17 a square foot triple net. You may think that's great. You know, my, my expenses are going to be, you know, whatever the space is times that $17 a square foot. However, they also mention as you're having a discussion with them that the cam charges for the, the space or cam expenses are an additional $3 per square foot. So in order to calculate your, your, your cash outflow, you would take your $17 a square foot plus the, the cam charges, which is $3 a square foot, sum them together to get $20 a square foot and multiply that by the $3,000 per or 3,000 or 3,000 square feet of space that you're looking to lease. Therefore, your monthly cash outflow attributable to that space is $60,000 per year or $5,000 per month. Now, what were to happen if you did not factor in that additional $3 per square foot when it, when it, as it pertains to CAM expenses? Well, $3 per square foot times 3,000 square feet gives you $9,000 that you would not have accounted for over the course of the year. That's Seven between seven and eight hundred dollars per month that you would have been shorting yourself as far as what what your actual obligation was, and you know if you're a business that's you know starting out or you know maybe is a newer business that could be crippling for from a from a cash flow perspective, and again that, that that's capital that you could potentially have been allocating elsewhere as well. So when you're doing these calculations and doing these analysis, it's really important to sit down and really understand what your actual monthly cash outflow is going to be for building related expenses. All right, so to, to kind of round it out, you know, this, this is something that as you start getting to a point where you are going to submit what's known as a letter of intent, meaning that you are going to, you know, what a letter of intent is, is a non-binding agreement where you specify the conditions that you're gonna be willing to accept as far as the, the lease is concerned. So you'd say, you know, I'm willing to accept this space if the rent's this, if, you know, we have this provision, this provision, this provision in place. Uh, essentially, it, 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 it creates a, a, uh, it, your intent to actually lease the space so that you can start working out an actual lease agreement. And ultimately, once all parties sign, there's a full, fully executed contract. Therefore, now you are actually leasing the space. So before we dive in this, just, I just want to be really, really clear. I'm not a lawyer, so this is not legal advice. I want to be very clear on that. I definitely don't want you to, you know, take this to the bank and say, oh, yeah, you know, Raphael gave me legal advice. No, I'm not a lawyer. So I really just want to specify that very clearly. So what I want to go ahead and do is just kind of run through a variety of different things to consider as you're going through lease negotiations with another party. So first and foremost, one thing I heavily advocate for with, for my clients is renewal options. Now, you may be wondering, what exactly is a renewal option? Well, a renewal option is a, an agreement that essentially says that I am going, I have the option or the, the right to release the space at some future date for these predetermined rates and terms, et cetera. So it essentially gives you the right to re-up on your lease with these predetermined rates or, or you know, other terms, et cetera. So the reason why I like to advocate for this is because it puts you as the tenant in the driver's seat. So let's say you execute a three-year lease with a three-year renewal option. Well, at the end of three years, you can choose to either renew your lease for whatever that rate is. And let's say the market goes gangbusters and now market rates are you know, 1.5 times what you were paying before. 
Well, now you can lock in your rate at a lower rate and you can control, you know, your, your destiny at that point versus if, if the market is not doing great and there's other options available out there, you may be able to say, well, you know what, I'm going to either A, renegotiate these terms because you choose not to exercise your option and now you want to renegotiate with a landlord or you can choose to go elsewhere. Um, so really, that's the reason why I advocate for renewal options is because it puts you as the tenant in the driver's seat. And, you know, the more renewal options you have, the more flexibility you have to be able to navigate, uh, depending on how your business is operating. So that's number one. Number two is who is responsible for what? I can't tell you how many times that I see within lease agreements that the landlords try to pass on expenses for maintenance for major mechanicals onto tenants. So they may have something in the provision, say, uh, the lease provision saying that, you know, we will cover all expenses for an HVAC system up to $500. Well, what does that mean? Well, if there's an expense that's more than $500, you will be responsible for covering it as the tenant. So you have to be very clear on what that looks like, because let's say that you move into the commercial space and then six months later, you know, the, 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 the full system malfunctions and now you have to replace the entire HVAC system. Well, these commercial HVAC systems are not cheap. So you could be costing your business a significant amount of money because you didn't clearly read the lease agreement and make sure that, in fact, those responsibilities were passed back uh, to the landlord. Um, you know, and, and this is it's extremely important with those major mechanicals like elevators, HVACs, you know, even roof structure, et cetera. You know, try in, in most situations, I would highly encourage you to try to pass along those replacement and major expenses over to the landlord. Number three is consider negotiating a sublease clause in place. Now, we all go into business thinking that we're going to be, you know, growing something very spectacular and, and awesome, which, again, is, is the reason why we're entrepreneurs, right? We, we, we believe in ourselves and we want to make sure that our, that our business grows and succeeds. And there's going to be situations where that's the case. And if that's the case, then, you know, you may be essentially, if you, let's say, let's imagine that you sign a five-year lease for a space and your, your business is growing like gangbusters. Well, you're tying yourself to that, that space for five years. Now, what a sublease clause does, it, is, is, it allows you to find a, another tenant that has to be of, of equal or similar um, financial standing as you oftentimes, and then allow them to sublease your space so that you can absolve, absolve you, yourself of some of the financial obligation. And that also works in reverse. Let's say your business is not doing too hot after a year and you decide maybe this is not the right endeavor for you. Well, if you have a five-year lease that you signed, you're on the hook for an additional four years. Whereas if you have a sublease in place, a sublease clause in place, you now can have the opportunity to try to backfill the space and thus relieve some of the financial obligation uh, from you and your business. And so, you know, it doesn't hurt to have a, a sublease clause. And oftentimes it's a good, you know, safety valve to, to include. And so those are some of the things that I really advocate for when I'm actually negotiating on behalf of my clients. Number four is an exclusivity clause. Now, this is more common in retail, in particular, if you're talking about a multi-tenant center. Uh, you know, I would imagine that if you run a, you know, a coffee shop or maybe, maybe coffee shop may be a bad example. Actually, no, it's actually a decent example. So let's say you're running a coffee shop and you're in a, you know, a, a 5,000 square foot center, right? Let's say you're occupying, or 6,000 square foot center, I should say, and you're occupying 2,000 square feet of space for your coffee shop. You don't want another coffee shop moving in right next door because that's not going to be good for business. So what happens? You can negotiate an exclusivity clause with the owner saying, you know, I only want to be, I want to be the only coffee vendor on site. And you can make it as specific or as loose as possible. Uh, but really, in these multi-tenant situations, you want to make sure that you're not going to invite your competitor to start moving in right next to you because you're just going to feed off each other and not not really, you know, succeed in the space. And so these, the, this clause is a lot more uh, important when it comes to multi-tenant centers. So you make sure you're not going to be competing with other, other, uh, some of your competitors. Along with that, we have what's known as a base year stop. Uh, so what that means is that if you're in a situation where you're responsible for paying all the taxes and insurance and general maintenance on the property, well, there's going to be situations where taxes increase building insurance increases. So you won't have a, 
um, you know, you, you have some variability when it comes to what your future expenses are going to be. And that's kind of unnerving to a lot of business owners because it's, they, they think, okay, well, maybe this year I'm paying five grand a month, but what if property taxes increase? What if building insurance increases? And especially now in an inflation environment, that's almost a certainty in certain scenarios. And so people are kind of scared what, what, what that means going forward as far as their building related expenses are concerned. So if you negotiate a base year stop, that means what essentially that means is that let's say that cam charges for the year are $3 a square foot. Well, you may be able to negotiate in your lease and say, okay, I'm willing to pay the $3 a square foot, Mr. Landlord. But after in subsequent years, you pay the difference between whatever that $3 a square foot is and what the ultimate cost is. So if, if in year two, the cost jumped to $3 and 50 cents a square foot, you as the tenant would be responsible for the $3 a square foot of building expenses. And then the additional 50% or 50 cents, I should say, will be the responsibility of the landlord. And so again, that's just something to consider just to help limit the variability of, of expenses in future years. Um, and that's something that I've definitely seen uh, in, in these lease agreements. And then finally, just a word of advice, carefully review your lease, read it 14, 15, however many times you need to in order for you to understand it. And again, some leases are very small and short and straight to the point, a couple pages, but I've seen leases that are 30 plus pages long. And if you don't understand what you're signing up for, I would highly encourage you to get a lawyer involved to be able to read it and review it and see if there's any points that you may be missing just because you're not reading it from a legal eye to make sure that you in fact understand and, and are, are be best protected under these, the, uh, the guise of, of, the, of the lease agreement as well. Because really, when you sign this lease agreement, it's not like, not like purchasing a property. You know, when you purchase a property, there's, there's the consummation of the transaction at the end, and then everyone goes their separate ways. Whereas with a commercial lease agreement, you may be in, in, a, in a building for 5, 10, 15, 20 years sometimes. So that's a living, breathing document that's going to essentially dictate how the relationship is going to go over the period of those years. And so I always encourage my clients, like even pay the extra however much you need to in order to have a lawyer review the final draft so you can clearly understand and you can make sure that there's nothing in there that could potentially uh, damage or hurt your business long term. So next steps, um, if in fact you are looking for commercial space, uh, you first off need to determine whether or not you need a commercial space. As we said before, there's a lot of businesses out there that don't necessarily need a commercial space. And then there's also individuals that maybe not, may, may not be ready to move forward with the space because of the financial commitment and you know, maybe their business is growing. Uh, very rapidly, and, but they're just not quite there yet to be able to commit to a space. That's, that's okay. Just, just work towards getting to that point, And then you can start moving forward to try to find uh, a space that's right for you. Number two is surround yourself with the right team. Typically, this means getting in uh, contact with a commercial agent. You know, a commercial lawyer is extremely important, in particular, lawyers that do commercial transactions. There are real estate lawyers out there, and they can probably handle most commercial leases, but a lot of times I like to make sure that my clients speak with people who that's all they do on a regular basis. They review commercial leases, they handle commercial transactions because that is a niche within the legal profession that again, has its own nuances. So it's always good to kind of talk to those individuals who operate in that capacity on a regular basis. Now, once you've surrounded yourself with the right team, you start reviewing local and national sites. We're located here in Kentucky. So KCREA is a phenomenal resource. That's kind of where a lot of the commercial brokers around the, the state post their listings. Uh, so that's a good starting point to be able to, to look at. There's also something called Crexy, which is a national platform, but it's one that has been uh, much more heavily adopted over the last several years. So there's usually pretty good, uh, you know, up-to-date information on that. And then LoopNet is kind of one that's been around for quite some time. I will say that LoopNet, their information is not the greatest. And a lot of times you'll see listings on LoopNet that have been gone for years. I had a client send me that a, a LoopNet listing the other day. They're like, oh, this, this, this warehouse looks super cheap. And then I do some research and at least back in 2015. So, you know, again, take it with a grain of salt when you see it on LoopNet, but that also can be a good resource for you to review. And then finally, just kind of a word of uh, a, a reiterating the word of advice, carefully read your lease agreement, make sure you understand it and really lean on your commercial real estate attorney to ensure that your best interests are met. All right, so I know that was a lot of information. I tend to talk very fast. I hope you guys got all that, but you know, if you guys have any questions in particular, I'd be happy to, to answer at this time. 
Yeah, so everyone just uh, um, look to your Q&A or your chat. You can post those uh, in there. Um, I did want to ask, uh, Raphael, have uh, the structure releases changed um, since uh, COVID? There are new provisions that are in there. and Yeah, I mean, I can't speak to the legal language as I'm not an attorney, but, you know, I will say that there have been, um, you know, th they've been taken into consideration in some instances. I know there was a, there was, I read some articles during the pandemic where landlords and tenants were having uh, battles as far as what's known as the force majeure clause, which means that act of God clause, you'll oftentimes see that with like hurricanes or floods or anything like that, where if that scenario takes place, that uh, oftentimes alleviates the responsibility of the tenant to, to comply with the provisions of the lease. Now they were, they were, that went up to the Supreme Court, if I'm not mistaken, um, in the article I read, and they kind of struck that down. Uh, mm -hmm. because it was such a, a widespread event. Now, you know, I don't know what that the legal implications of that are going forward. Again, I'm not a not attorney, but that is something that I'd seen uh, in the past. And, you know, it's sa same thing with, you know, I know with riots and such as well, that could also be factored into, you know, some of those provisions as well. Okay, okay. Well, I haven't seen anything uh, come in, which is always a great sign, because I think you've answered a lot of questions or maybe put some thought into folks head that they hadn't even considered um, some areas before. Um, you have an amazing YouTube channel. So if you will take a moment to plug that because it's a great resource. Oh, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I'm glad you get good value from it. Yeah, I have a channel. Uh, it's just my name. And, and literally every week I, I produce videos on commercial real estate. So I have a, a segment called frequently asked questions for commercial real estate where I answer questions pertaining to commercial real estate. I also run a few meetups called one we we'll call it commercial real estate 101, where we interview people from literally across the country. I've had I've interviewed people in New York City and in Houston and Dallas and in Chicago, California, literally all across the country. And yeah, we talk about a variety of different commercial real estate topics. Um, I also have a podcast called the Commercial Real Estate Academy, where we, we interview people from all across the country pertaining to commercial real estate. And and as as I mentioned before, I, I've written a few books. Uh, one of which, you know, I, I was going to give you guys an opportunity to uh, get a free link on and just you can download the PDF for free. Uh, it, it is a, you know, a comprehensive guide to leasing commercial space. And I'll be releasing my latest book, which is before you buy that building, the Small Business Owner's Guide to Leasing Commercial or uh, Buying Commercial Real Estate, I should say. And that's going to be released in July. So I'll keep you guys posted on that as well. That's excellent. So when, so I was going to tell everyone that we'll send a, a record the recording of today's uh, event out to you, so you'll have this link. Uh, you don't necessarily have to write it, try and write it down while we're we're talking, but uh, we'll have that out to you. Um, and you're going to join us again uh, on July twelfth. Uh, I'll let you kind of talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. No. Well, it's 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 going to be somewhat. Uh, it won't be similar because it's a completely different process, but it's going to be related to the acquisition of commercial property. So we're going to be talking about, you know, what does the acquisition look like? You know, what's the financing that you're, 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 that are, that's available to you? What does the due diligence process look like? What are some of the things you need to consider as you're going through the process of acquiring? And then ultimately, you know, consummating the relationship or the consummating the, the transaction at the end so that you can actually acquire the property and then move forward uh, to, you know, operate your business out of it. So. Yeah, we're really looking forward to that. So again, July twelfth uh, at twelve o'clock, we'll send uh, we'll send that information out uh, in the next week or so. Um, thank you for joining us, uh, coming back to us, and uh, presenting today. Uh, always some great information uh, for our clients. And uh, um, like I said, we'll send the recording. We'll have the uh, evaluation uh, uh, available as well as you close out of the event today. So. Uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, Raphael, we'll see you next month. Sounds good. Thanks again, guys. It was great seeing you. Bye, everybody. See you soon. Ciao.